This is the most disturbing and unsettling thing you will ever watch. This is called The Strange Thing About the Johnsons, and it's the most disturbing short film ever. It's written and directed by Ari Aster, who did Hereditary and Midsummer, and we all know how scary and messed up those movies are. The film follows the Johnson family, who is just a normal suburban family, but as the film goes on, a shocking secret is revealed, and this secret will make you sick to your stomach. I'm not going to spoil anything, but I remember my first time watching this, and I couldn't stop saying, what the hell is going on? This film just has such an unsettling vibe to it, and it'll make you feel so uneasy. You can watch the whole film on YouTube right now, and it's only around 29 minutes. But don't let the short time fool you, this film is absolutely disturbing. After you watch The Strange Thing About the Johnsons, come back to this video and let me know your thoughts on it. This is completely disturbing and messed up, and not everyone can finish it. And you will find out extremely quickly when you start watching it. And a word of advice, whatever you do, never watch this with your parents. Rebel Wilson is making some pretty disturbing allegations against Sasha Baron Cohen. She's claiming that he asked her to stick her finger up his bum on set, and she claims that he also repeatedly asked her to strip for their movie together, even though she told him multiple times she doesn't do stuff like that. So Sasha Baron Cohen, if you don't know him, is a very famous comedic actor, beloved by many for his roles in films like The Dictator, Borat, Ali G, and he's a pretty powerful, outspoken guy in Hollywood, so these allegations are pretty shocking. These allegations come directly from Rebel Wilson's new memoir, Rebel Rising, in which she calls Sasha an asshole. The two worked together on the 2016 comedy The Brothers Grimsby. She says in the memoir that he repeatedly asked her to strip for future scenes in the film, and she repeatedly had to tell him that she doesn't do stuff like that. According to her, she laughed it off at first, but then something disturbing happened. Allegedly, Sasha told her that they were going to film an extra scene. She claims that he then pulled his pants down and said, now you're going to stick your finger up my bum. And she claims that she absolutely refused to do it. Afterwards, she says she felt scared and compromised, so she played along, slapped him on the bum a couple times, and then they quit doing this whole thing. I don't know, this is some pretty weird stuff. What are your guys' thoughts on these allegations? This deadly disaster changed theme parks forever. I didn't think there could be anything more terrifying than being trapped in a burning building. That was until I heard of this horrific fire inside a haunted maze. It was May 1984 at New Jersey's Great Adventure Amusement Park. The park had been growing in popularity and more and more people had been attending. One popular ride was a haunted house, which was named Haunted Castle. Now it was essentially like a spooky maze. There was limited visibility inside the castle due to features like fog to make it more confusing. It featured creepy characters such as a vampire and a butcher. On the 11th of the month at roughly half past six, a fire broke out inside. It's believed that one of the guests was actually holding up a lighter to help them with visibility in a very dark corridor. Some padding inside accidentally caught fire and set the place ablaze. Tragically, there were 29 guests and staff members trapped. Now, as the haunted castle was obviously built to be disorienting and confusing, it was just that. People were completely stuck with very few exits. Horrifically, there were no sprinklers and no smoke alarms. The fire engulfed the ride within minutes and panicked park goers were trapped amongst the flames. Eight teenagers died in the fire. After the horrific incident, laws were implemented requiring sprinklers and smoke detectors. This is breaking news. One of the deadliest mass shootings in American history just happened tonight. This is suspect Robert Card from Maine, and he killed 22 people tonight and injured a further 60. So I'm just reporting on this news as it comes out, but this is Robert Card. And according to reports, he's a pedophile that was previously arrested for the possession of CP or CSAM. So according to official reports, 50 to 60 people have been injured by this man and 22 people are dead. These shootings took place at a number of different places across Maine, including a bowling alley, a Walmart distribution center, and a pool hall. These are the images of the suspect that have been released, and as of the recording of this TikTok, he has not been caught yet. Apparently, local authorities have been able to locate Robert's car, but they haven't found Robert yet. And in fact, they think that he might be fleeing by boat out into the open ocean. This is Robert right here. You can search him up on the National Sex Offender Registry. He is a registered sex offender. And yeah, we're going to get more developments as this carries on. But wow, what an absolute tragic day for America.
This has already become, sadly, the eighth deadliest shooting in American history. And I'm sure as the people who were wounded get treated and time goes on, it's going to grow and grow with the number of casualties. This is just absolutely tragic. And Jesus Christ, I hope that they find and locate and arrest Robert soon. This teenager vanished on her morning run. A strange confession would raise more questions than answers. Rachel Cook was 19 years old, attending junior college in San Diego. It was the 10th of January 2002, and it was actually winter break, so she was staying with her parents in Georgetown, Texas. On the day in question, her mum Janet left to go to work at around 8am. Now, Rachel had actually been sleeping at the time that her mum left for work. When she woke up, she decided to go on her normal morning run. Now, Rachel was a good runner and regularly ran about four miles per day. She's believed to have left the house at around half past nine. An eyewitness did reportedly see Rachel that morning. It was reportedly around 11 a.m. near her finish spot. Now, this actually wasn't far from her parents' house. However, when her dad got home at around 3 p.m. that day, Rachel was nowhere to be found. Her family got really concerned and a huge search began for the missing teen. A white car was reportedly seen in the area that morning, but frustratingly, the case went cold. The case was aired on Unsolved Mysteries and America's Most Wanted in 2002. No one really had any more information until 2006. That was when a shocking confession came from an inmate called Michael Moore. He confessed to murdering Rachel. He claimed that he'd abducted her and killed her. He said he disposed of her body on the Gulf of Mexico. However, he later retracted the statement and said that he made up the confession in order to gain preferential treatment. It's unknown whether the statement was accurate or not. Rachel's dad sadly passed away in 2014, still not knowing what happened to his missing daughter. It's been 22 years and still Rachel remains missing. This is the case of Dr. Death. Dr. Death? The only reason why he got caught was because he got messy. His mm -hmm. name was Dr. Harold Shipman. He was even in a documentary in, um, for BBC about like taking care of the human body, being a good doctor what and stuff like fuck? that. And he ended up opening Shipman's medical practice, which is his own medical practice, right? But he also had a weirdly high percentage of deaths in his patients. How much? A total of 215 confirmed killings. Every single death that he would write down, the way that they would die is that he walked in on them dead. Or that he left to go get something from his car and they're dead. So it was always this abrupt death until one time Kathleen Grundy. She wasn't really like sick or anything like that. But obviously she was old so she was getting taken care of by Dr. Harold Shipman. He put in the death certificate, died of old age. Also, what well, basically just f***ed everything up and why he got sloppy out of nowhere. Kathleen Grundy's will comes out okay. saying my family isn't in need I want to leave all my estate to the doctor that makes no sense what the f and when you have a will you have to have witnesses sign to make sure that this statement is legit the daughter ends up going to the the witnesses to see if they actually signed turns out none of them signed that's when the cops finally arrested him after they ended up doing a analysis on her body an actual autopsy because what he would do is he wouldn't get autopsies on the bodies he would just write that They're they dead. died of old age and then instead of telling the family members yo we should get an autopsy of why they died they would just send them to the morgue to get cremated damn so this just, motherfucker was like already on this shit what the f basically they determined that kathleen grundy had died of an overdose of morphine they ended up doing like this pedophile mom in ohio committed one of the most horrific crimes i've ever read about I'm going to add a trigger warning in here right now. This is a very, very disturbing story, so viewer discretion is advised. So this is Ashley Jessup from Ohio. And in 2012, she was found guilty of grape and sentenced to life in prison. But who did Ashley assault? Well, it was her own 10-month-old baby. At the time of this crime, Ashley was dating 24-year-old Jordan Russell. The two seemed to be very in love and they frequently exchanged explicit materials over email and text message, of themselves, obviously. But then in August of 2011, Jordan asked Ashley to do something shocking. He asked her to perform explicit acts on her own 10-month-old baby son. And obviously, he wanted her to film it and send it to him so he could keep these videos and images. And for some shocking reason, Ashley actually obliged and she performed graphic and gruesome acts on her own son. So later that month, Jordan had actually broken up with Ashley and he already had a new girlfriend. And this new girlfriend of Jordan's was going through his computer when she discovered these extremely disturbing images and contacted the police. 
So obviously when the details of this case were made public, everybody was absolutely shocked. And the judge in this case actually stated that in his 30 year career, this was one of the most bizarre and disturbing cases he had ever had to cover. So Ashley was eventually convicted of a litany of charges, including assault, grape on a minor, everything like that. And she's still in prison to this day, serving out that life sentence. Now, this is a really, really disturbing story, and I really do think that she should be in prison for a very, very long time. This isn't a true crime story as such. It's a little bit different to what I usually do, but this story today, reading about it, has absolutely broken my heart, and I just have to get it out. This is two-year-old Bronson Battersby, and he was found alongside his dead father. His father had suffered a heart attack. He was 60 years old, and he was alone at home with Bronson. Bronson was then obviously not able to take care of himself. There was nobody else there. And he sadly passed away too from starvation and dehydration. The pair were last seen at the end of December. I think it was around Boxing Day. According to Stephen's autopsy, the earliest he could have passed away is the 29th of December. They weren't found until the 9th of January. It's obviously unclear exactly when Bronson passed away. But just thinking about this little two-year-old... He must have been so confused as to why his dad wasn't waking up. He was found curled up next to his father. There was also a dog in the house, which was emaciated but alive. Shockingly, a social worker had actually visited the house on the 2nd of January, but she got no answer, so she did inform the police. Two days later, a second visit occurred and still there was no answer, so the police were informed again. But it wasn't until five days after that that she then obtained a key from Stephen's landlord and entered the house and found them. I feel like as they were a vulnerable pair, they were considered vulnerable. If you'd knocked on that door as a social worker the first time and got no answer, the second time two days later, isn't that suspicious? Why then wait another five days? There is now a rapid review into the case and it's just such a tragic story. I can't actually believe it. This is by far one of the worst ways somebody has ever died, and whatever you do, don't look up the video. This is the most disturbing sporting accident I ever came across. On January 19th, 1991, the Lamberthorne race was cancelled due to a horrible skiing accident. Gurnett Rangstandler, who was a 20-year-old contestant, was going downhill at full speed when he suddenly lost control as he was approaching the finish line. And he then slammed head-on into safety nets at extremely high speeds. This then trapped one of his skis inside the net, which resulted in his right leg almost being completely torn off. He also fractured his pelvis and was literally ripped in half. The impact caused serious internal injuries, fractures, and nerve damages. He was then transported by a helicopter to a hospital in Switzerland, where he received several blood transfusions, but despite receiving numerous blood transfusions, both during and after the operation, he later passed away from severe pelvic bleeding. The video is extremely graphic and I'll explain it to you right now. In the video you see Gurnett going down a ski mountain when he suddenly goes airborne. He then collides with the safety net mid-air while going full speed, and his body then starts sliding down the mountain, but at this point you immediately notice something is wrong. As his body is spitting out of control, a trail of blood is following him, staining the entire mountain in the process. And at this point you see a lot of blood and you also see Gurnett almost ripped in half. His body then stops at the bottom of the hill as a pool of blood forms around him and people come to help. This video is just awful because it's one of those things that you can't imagine ever happening, but it does. How does a safety net rip somebody's body in half? It's just honestly insane and please don't look up the video because it's extremely disturbing. Chilling murder remained unsolved for decades, but a Facebook message of a stranger may change everything. It was the 24th of March, 2004. Jim Kluwer had driven 45 minutes to Boyston in Chicago to visit his son, Kevin. Kevin was 31 and lived in an apartment and had failed to show up for work. His car was in the car park of the apartment complex, so that was good news. However, when his dad knocked on the door, there was no reply. Now, Jim knew this was very strange considering the car was there, so he decided to force entry into the apartment. What he discovered would haunt him forever. Kevin was lying in the fetal position, deceased. He'd been stabbed in the back a total of 42 times. He was actually nude, covered in just a robe. Police were obviously called and an investigation began. 
The murder seemed extremely violent and personal, so police concluded this must be somebody that he knew. However, Kevin didn't seem to have any enemies at all. The night prior to his death, Kevin had actually been going out with a friend from Minnesota. Kevin went to a nightclub in the local area and apparently met somebody named Fernando. Kevin's friend reported seeing Kevin leave the nightclub with Fernando. The man is described as white and Hispanic and around five foot seven. The case went frustratingly cold until around 2020. It was at this point that Kevin's brother, Ron, got a Facebook message from a woman. She claimed to know who killed Kevin. Now, investigators were obviously involved and they felt that the message was legit. The woman seemed to include details that had actually never been made public. Ron believes that Kevin was targeted by this Fernando and another man. He feels that Kevin may have been attacked during a robbery attempt. Now, the most up-to-date information that I could find is that the pandemic caused some delays with the investigation and Kevin's case is still unsolved. Tragically, both of Kevin's parents have passed away. This woman cut the baby out of her pregnant friend and this case is absolutely sickening. This is the case of Lisa Montgomery. She constantly lied about being pregnant and having miscarriages. And in 2004, she became friends with a pregnant woman whose name was Bobby Stinnett. And on December 16th, 2004, Lisa Montgomery entered Stinnett's house and murdered her by strangulation. Lisa then cut Stinnett's unborn baby from her womb and fled the scene. Stinnett's body was discovered by her mother lying in a pool of blood approximately an hour after the murder. She called the police immediately and described the wounds inflicted upon her daughter as appearing as if her stomach exploded. Just imagine that for a second. Paramedics were unsuccessful in attempts to revive Stinnett and she was pronounced dead. Lisa Montgomery allegedly called her husband Kevin that same day around 5.15 p.m. saying that on a shopping trip she had gone into labor and given birth. The following day on December 17th, police went to Montgomery's home and when they arrived, they found a car matching the description of the one at the crime scene. And when they entered the home, they found Lisa Montgomery inside holding the infant baby and watching television. Montgomery was then arrested an hour later after her story fell apart and she confessed. The kidnapped newborn baby that she cut out of her friend, whom she claimed was her own, was recovered and given back to the father. Lisa Montgomery was then put on death row and was recently executed by lethal injection on January 13th, 2021. This girl was so obsessed with having a baby of her own that she literally cut one out of her friend. And keep in mind, her friend was eight months pregnant. She built a connection with this child and it was literally hers. Can you just imagine what Joe Stinnett was thinking in that moment? I can't even imagine the emotions that was running through her body. All in all, this case is absolutely sickening and Lisa Montgomery definitely deserved what she got. Less than two hours after that video was filmed, the girl on stage in that video would be dead. Her name was Christina Grimmie. She was a famous singer here in America and she was murdered in 2016. So Christina had been making music and performing all of her life, but her real rise to fame started when she was on the show The Voice. After Christina was on The Voice, the world kind of opened up for her. She made her major label debut, she started going on tours all across the world, and she was a rising star. Sadly though, she attracted the attention of a very disturbed individual who can actually be seen here in footage from her final show, creepily watching Christina perform from the crowd, knowing what he was about to do. That man was 27-year-old Kevin James Loibel. So Christina's performance that evening ended at about 10 p.m. And afterwards, she moved over to a little booth to sign autographs for people who had come to the show. At around 10.24 p.m., Kevin approached Christina. Christina, thinking he was just like every other fan there, opened her arms up to give him a big hug. But that's when Kevin retrieved a Glock pistol from his person and shot her three times at point-blank range. After the shots rang out, Christina's brother tackled Kevin to the ground. Yes, sadly, Christina's brother was there working the booth with her that evening. But after a fight, Kevin managed to get himself free. He retrieved his Glock and he took his own life right next to Christina's body. Sadly, Christina had been shot twice in the chest and once in the head. And by 10.59 p.m., not even a full hour after she finished her performance, Christina Grimmie was pronounced dead. Afterwards, Kevin's family left this note for the media. This was all they had to say after the tragedy. But fans, even to this day, remember Christina as an amazing singer 
and talk about the potential that she had if she hadn't been taken from this world so quickly. If you want to listen to more true crime stories, check out the podcast Murder in America that I co-host with my wife, Courtney. You can listen to it on any streaming platform. This tragic incident honestly sounds like something out of Final Destination. It's absolutely horrific and it might make you think twice about riding the river rapids at the next theme park you visit. This incident happened in 2016 at Australia's Dreamworld. Four adults and two children boarded a raft on the Thunder River Rapids, but at some point during the ride, a pump malfunctioned and it caused the water level to drop, meaning that the rafts couldn't travel along the conveyor as they should. The raft on the right of this picture had become stuck. It was completely stranded and couldn't move along. The raft on the left was carrying six people and it flew down the conveyor into the empty raft, which caused it to fly into the air and land on its side. Luckily, the two children that were aboard that raft landed on a platform at the side of the ride and were completely fine. But the four adults were sucked underneath the mechanism. Two of them became trapped under the empty raft and they drowned. And the other two became trapped in the ride's mechanism and they were crushed to death. The victims were Kate Goodchild, her brother Luke Dorset, his partner Rusi Aragi and a woman named Cindy Lowe. The two children on the ride were Kate's 12-year-old daughter and Cindy's 10-year-old son. A witness described hearing screams and seeing blood run into the water. It honestly sounds like the most horrific nightmare imaginable. Seven emergency crews attended the scene and it was that horrific to deal with that several of the paramedics ended up needing counselling. It was found after the incident that it could have been easily prevented. The safety of this ride hadn't been assessed in over 30 years and it was said that it was just an accident waiting to happen. The ride was soon demolished and it was turned into a memorial for the victims. And the operator of the park, Ardent Leisure, were fined $3.6 million, although they actually ended up paying out more than $5 million in compensation to the victims' families. This young man got ran over by a train and lost both of his legs. In 2017, Jacob O lost both of his legs below the knee when he was run over by a train in Laburn. Jacob was walking along the train tracks with earbuds on on March 2nd when he sensed but didn't hear a train approaching behind him. Jacob's lawsuit also claims that the CSX train did not have properly functioning front-facing cameras, preventing the train's engineer and conductor from seeing Jacob in time to avoid hitting him. The CSX company also did not put up fencing or any other warning devices to keep pedestrians at a safe distance from the tracks. Jacob was also at least 1,000 feet away from the train when the conductor first saw him, but they did not ring the train's bell, blow the train's horn, or apply the emergency brake before hitting Jacob. It also took a half a mile for the train to completely stop after hitting Jacob. Now, what I'm about to show you is the 911 call Jacob made right after getting hit by the train. And keep in mind, he just lost both of his legs. They were literally amputated from his body from the train. And just listen to how calm he's talking. It's like he didn't even get hit by a train. Come on, one, the location of your emergency. Um, let's go hit by a train. Okay, where are you? I'm, a, I'm off the path of the park in downtown Melbourne. Okay, were you walking or were you driving? No, I was walking. Okay, but you're okay? Like, you sound like you're... No. Businessman disappeared into thin air until a trucker came forward with a fascinating claim. John Cheek was a successful 28-year-old from Memphis, Tennessee. He'd finished business school and got a job as a chief financial officer at a real estate company. His family were obviously extremely proud of him and he had his whole career ahead of him. That's what made his sudden disappearance so unsettling. 
John was working incredibly hard and it was paying off. He was traveling all across the world and had a million pound deal he was just about to close. By now it was December 1993. It was incredibly out of character when on the second of the month he vanished. He failed to turn up for work and his colleagues were incredibly concerned. As the day went on, some people at his work just presumed that he must have been so burnt out from all the work he was doing and potentially just needed a rest. The following day, a worrying discovery was made. John's car was found abandoned 12 miles away from where he lived. The car was positioned where the highway crosses over the Mississippi River. When police examined the car, there was no sign of foul play. Theories spread that maybe John had ended his life off the bridge. However, they did a full search of the river and nothing was found. Then there was a very strange development. Two months after he vanished in February, a man named Ron Jackson happened to be traveling through the area. He worked as a trucker and was used to just being in lots of different locations. He was stopped in his tracks when he saw a missing persons poster with a man on it that he recognized. The face was John Cheek. Ron had met him the day before. Ron said the pair had bumped into each other at a truck stop in Virginia. Now, Ron stated that the reason why he did remember John's face was that he didn't seem to be like the usual people that he would meet there. He noticed he had a crisp, bright white shirt on and seemed to be very well educated. Now, Ron described his demeanor as rambling. He said he was definitely not 100% in all his mental capabilities. Ron also described him as wearing slip-on moccasins. John's family confirmed this is exactly the type of shoe that he wore. Theories then spread that maybe John had experienced mental health difficulties arising from stress. It's theorized that maybe he developed some kind of amnesia. To this day, there have been no other sightings of John. This is the escalator incident, one of the worst ways somebody has ever died explained. The image you see here is an escalator from a mall in China, specifically in the city of Jingzhou. In the background, you can see a woman in a white top and a black skirt carrying a child. That is 31-year-old mother Shang Lingjian. And in front of her, you can see two mall employees. And allegedly, they were telling Zhang that the panels right here at the top of the escalator were broken. And that they would need to jump over them so that nothing would happen. Now, I'm not going to show the video of what happens to Zhang, but I will explain it. When she gets to the very top of the escalator, she picks up her young boy. And she then steps onto the silver platform thinking she's hopping over where they told her to hop over. But in fact, she stands on the loose panel and the moment she does, the panel gives out. And Zhang and her son drop. Somehow she had the strength and thought to lift her son up and actually push him over the extra area and luckily saving his life. But she would not be so lucky. She was then trapped in this compartment of the escalator while it was still going. So what happened was when she fell in, the escalator basically just sucked her up and she essentially became entangled in the escalator itself. And ultimately, she would then be crushed to death, all in front of the eyes of her husband and young son. The only silver lining is that she was able to save her son because if he had fallen in as well, he would have suffered the same fate. I don't know how long she survived in there, if it was instant death or if it took time. But all I know is that it had to be excruciating for however long it might have taken. It would then take a rescue crew four hours to open the escalator and recover the 31-year-old mother's body. The crazy thing about this whole situation is the mall employees called this issue in but did nothing about it. They didn't put a sign up saying not to use the escalators and it was just still running. All they had to do was press this little button to stop the escalator and there's one at the top and there's one at the bottom. The two employees should have been at the bottom telling everybody not to go on this escalator because they knew what could happen. And now a husband and his child had to watch a loved one die. This is absolutely awful and may she rest in peace. This devastating UK football stadium tragedy killed 56 people. Valley Parade is the Bradford City Stadium located in West Yorkshire. On the 11th of May 1985, it was hosting a football match between Bradford City and Lincoln. It was the final game of the season and fans were in high spirits. There was a crowd of around 11,000 in attendance. Now the score was nil-nil at around 3.40. At this time, the commentator noticed a small fire. It appeared to be around three rows from the back in one of the stands. It turned out that a man had a lit cigarette and he tried to put it on the floor to put it out with his foot. The cigarette was on the floorboard and actually fell through the floorboards onto the ground. 
The man tried to pour the rest of his coffee on top of it to put it out. However, a couple of minutes later, he noticed smoke, so he called a steward over. It took less than four minutes for the fire to spread to an unimaginable degree. Unfortunately, the stand actually had a wooden roof that was due to be replaced with a steel roof at the end of the season. The fire had engulfed the entire stand and panicked fans were trapped in the blaze. Crowds of people were desperately trying to flee the stand and get onto the pitch. Exit doors were locked and people were banging desperately trying to break them down. Tragically, many fans were burnt to death. 56 people were killed in the disaster. 265 were injured. That's not to mention the absolute hundreds of people who witnessed people die and were literally traumatized for life. The youngest victim was just 11 years old. The oldest was the 86 year old former chairman. Now there were so many fans in the disaster who were praised for being heroes. More than 50 people were awarded for bravery. One was 10 year old schoolgirl Joanne Barron. It was her first ever football match. Now she actually really terrifyingly got separated from her family during the panic. She ended up helping an elderly man escape before trying to escape herself. She suffered severe burns all over her body and had to undergo multiple surgeries. When interviewed, she stated, I wasn't frightened at the time and I just carried on doing what I could do. She was given an award for her bravery presented by Princess Diana. An inquest into the disaster concluded a death by misadventure outcome. The tragedy obviously caused changes in UK stadium regulations. Wooden stands were banned and Bradford City is now affiliated with the Bradford Burns Unit as its official charity. This is the Trey Sesler case, the YouTuber who murdered his entire family. This is Trey Sesler and he was known as Mr. Anime on YouTube. Back in the early days of YouTube, Trey was actually a super popular creator on the platform. And he's also been credited to kickstart the anime community all on YouTube. In his videos, he would review anime, video games, and stuff like that and he got a couple hundred thousand followers. But as time went on, people started to realize something wasn't right. He started to make a lot of videos with weapons in them, like guns, and he also posted images and talked about how he had killed animals. He used real weapons in some of his videos, and he even went to random buildings at night and just shot at them for no reason at all. But in 2012, Trey's life would take a disturbing turn. In February of that year, he posted on his channel saying that he was going to reward himself and take a break. But on March 13th, 2012, he said he found a new job, which was 100% going to prevent him from posting on YouTube in the future. And on March 20th, 2012, Trey decided he was going to kill people. And he decided to start out by killing his family. On that day, he went to his family's home and lured his mom into the garage. And he then shot her in the chest at point blank range, killing her. He then went back into the house and shot his brother dead in the head. Trey's father, who was sleeping, woke up from all the gunshots and walked over to investigate. And Trey then shot him in the chest, just like he did to his mom. And to even make it more sinister, after doing this and killing his entire family, he walked around the house killing all of the family's pets. He then took ammunition and weapons and started walking towards the high school at the end of the street. And we could all assume what his climactic plan was. Trey later claimed that he wanted to kill at least 70 students at the school so that he could be the deadliest mass killer in United States history. And he said he killed his family first because he didn't want them to see what he was about to do and said that he was completely inspired by the Columbine killers. But thankfully, right before Trey was about to commit the shooting at the school, he backed down and was quickly arrested afterwards. Also, after the shootings, it was discovered that he had written a lot of stuff all over the doors and walls and this was evidence that he had been disturbed for quite a long time. This is just an insane case, and I can't believe stuff like this happens so consistently in our world. However, according to the phrase, you can't make this stuff up, like have known the story of real life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with gray hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic, child, murderer, and cannibal. This case will put you off ever talking to anyone online. This male stabbed his girlfriend over 90 times and then FaceTimed his sister to show her the dead body. Ashley Wadsworth was a 19 year old girl who met Jack Seppel on Facebook in 2015. She was roughly 11 or 12 at the time and Jack was around 15 or 16. They spent the following years continuously sharing messages and chatting online about their lives. Now Ashley was from Canada and Jack was from Essex in the UK. 
Jack treated her really nicely to begin with, talking to her all the time and showering her with gifts and attention. When Ashley turned 16, the relationship between the two began to develop. Ashley would ask her parents often if she could go to the UK to travel to meet Jack. At first, they were obviously against this, seeing as Jack lived abroad and the two had never met. However, in 2021, Ashley had graduated high school and saved up to make the trip to meet Jack. Jack actually reassured Ashley's family that he would guard her with his life. Little did they know, she wouldn't actually need protecting from anyone other than him. In November 2021, the pair met for the first time. They went sightseeing around London and Ashley documented this on her social media. However, things began to take a turn over the next couple of months. Jack started controlling Ashley. He demanded her social media passwords and made her delete photos without him in them. He also became physically abusive towards her. She was covered in bruises from Jack and in one altercation, he smashed a glass over her head. The young girl tried to reach out for help from her friends, but it was clear she was scared of Jack. Bearing in mind, Jack had access to all of her social media. She sent a message to one of her friends one day warning, be careful what you say, he's watching. And she then unsent the message to prevent him seeing it. On the 1st of February, 2022, Ashley turned up to Jack's mum's flat barefoot. She had run there. She was crying and hysterical. She said Jack had smashed her phone, beat her up and cut her hand. Now, following this incident, her parents actually booked her a flight home. She was relieved by this and returned to Jack's flat to wait to go home. Now that day, bearing in mind this is now obviously nighttime in Canada, Ashley's sister received a text begging her to wake up and answer the phone. When she eventually got this message, she tried to ring Ashley back and got no reply. At this point, Jack's mum tried to go round to Jack's house and get in. She wasn't able to do so and the police were eventually called. When officers arrived, Jack wouldn't open the door, so they forced entry. They found an absolutely hideous scene. Jack was lying next to Ashley's dead body in a pool of blood. Jack was casually on FaceTime to his sister, showing her the dead body. He admitted to strangling her and stabbing her. Jack was sentenced to life with a minimum of 23 and a half years. Jeffrey Epstein's private plane, the Lolita Express, that was used throughout all of his sex trafficking operations is about to be torn to pieces. This is breaking news that was just announced a day or two ago, so let's talk about it. So if you don't know what the Lolita Express is, it was Jeffrey Epstein's private plane that he used to fly all of his victims around the country, around the globe. And it was the flight logs on this plane that have become one of the major points of contention in the entire Jeffrey Epstein case. Because you see, there were tons of celebrities and politicians that flew on the Lolita Express, including Bill Clinton, who's pictured right here with Ghislaine Maxwell. And there's just something about this picture that rubs me the wrong way. I mean, this is a former U.S. president standing on a private plane of a sex trafficker holding another sex trafficker who's convicted and now in prison for a photo. And he is claiming he had no idea what was going on. But yeah, according to this news article, a man bought this airplane at an auction just thinking it was another airplane. He had no idea of the previous history. He was hoping he could kind of refurbish it, fix it up, resell it, but when he learned that the plane he purchased was the Lolita Express, one of the most infamous planes ever built, he decided he would just scrap it and sell all the parts. And it's totally understandable because of the wicked, dark, cruel, twisted history of this plane. There are some pictures of the interior of the plane though that are interesting that were posted with this article. I mean, look at this couch. There was a bed in the plane with a ton of different sets of linens for easy use and changing. Eerie, just like looking in the bathrooms and the cabinets. There were tables, different chairs to sit in. And these pictures just ooze eeriness. I mean, who knows what kind of evil twisted shit was going on in these chairs and in these spaces. Especially in the bed right here, the chairs. I mean, this plane just looks dark and just evil. And it's hard to imagine all of the young girls who were looking in these mirrors, staring at themselves, being forced to do the unthinkable. I mean, it was a really nice plane, but I really, really wonder what they're going to find when they tear this thing apart. I mean, I don't think that Epstein or any of his associates would be stupid enough to leave something like recording devices or audio recordings, video recordings somewhere on the plane. But if Jeffrey Epstein did have those secret cameras and audio recorders hidden all over the plane like people claimed he did, who knows what they're going to find. And once again, I just want to add how strange it is that there are so many celebrities and politicians that flew on this plane that are logged in the flight logs and they claim to be completely 
just in the dark about this entire operation. And I find that just so, so incredibly hard to believe. This is the Baby Brianna case, one of the most horrendous cases ever explained. The Baby Brianna case is one of the most gut-turning cases you will ever hear about. Baby Brianna wouldn't live past five months old thanks to her mother, father, and uncle. On July 19, 2002, Stephanie Lopez, Baby Brianna's mother, made a 911 call stating that her five-month-old baby wasn't breathing. They then rushed Baby Brianna to the hospital where they were unsuccessful at trying to bring her back, and she was pronounced dead. And once the autopsy was made public, the residents of the New Mexico town understood this just wasn't a terrible accident, but instead intentional. The autopsy revealed that baby Brianna endured more physical beatings than any human should have to experience in their lifetime. And she was only five months old. It was announced and ruled that baby Brianna died from cranial cerebral injuries. She had visible bruisings and scabbing all over her forehead and head. Along with the scabbing and bruising, baby Brianna also had two skull fractures that were several days old. Baby Brianna also had signs of human bite marks, not just a few human bite marks, multiple, as in 15. She had two rib fractures that were two weeks old. She had been violently shaken at least twice in her lifetime due to her optical nerves being filled with new and old blood. She suffered bucket handle fractures caused by her legs and arms being violently forced, yanked, or pulled in different directions, and even out of their socket. Along with these fractures and head injuries, Baby Brianna also had injuries consisting with sexual assault. According to Baby Brianna's mother, Stephanie Lopez, and the father, Andrew Walters, the night of July 18th went something like this, and this was the last night Baby Brianna was alive. Andrew got off work and went home to play video games. He played video games and drank beer with some other family members until 12.30 a.m. and he went to bed. He then said Stephanie got up around 7 a.m. and found Brianna unresponsive, prompting them to call 911. However, after more questioning, Andrew started to crack in his interrogation and suddenly he revealed the truth. Andrew admitted to biting his five-month-old daughter and was able to identify the bite marks that he made. He stated that he was playing a little roughly with baby Brianna. He also mentioned that he and baby Brianna's uncle, Stephen Lopez, were throwing baby Brianna up in the air and not catching her, letting her hit the ground extremely hard. They even threw her up at the ceiling, smacking her head against it. Stephen Lopez, baby Brianna's uncle, admitted to drinking several beers that night. He stated he didn't remember starting sexual activity with his five-month-old niece, but he said he stopped himself from committing a sex act because he knew it was wrong. These fatal injuries are what cost baby Brianna her life at just five months old. Andrew Walters, baby Brianna's father, was sentenced to 57 years in prison. Stephen Lopez, baby Brianna's uncle, was sentenced to 51 years in prison. And lastly, Stephanie Lopez, baby Brianna's mother, was sentenced to 27 years in prison. However, due to good behavior, she was released on parole early, which is just insane. Nobody that does something this horrific should ever get out of prison or stay alive. This case really rubs me the wrong way because baby Brianna was only five months old, not even experiencing one year of life. This is one of those cases where after you read it and research it, your day just feels weird. I hope these parents burn in hell and may baby Brianna rest in peace. This pedophile committed a crime so disturbing that a petition was created that asked the government to publicly hang him. And the petition gathered thousands of signatures. This is 33-year-old Benjamin Taylor from West Virginia, and in 2016, he would commit one of the most sickening crimes I've ever read about. Back in 2016, Benjamin was living with his girlfriend, a woman named Amanda Adkins. At the time, Amanda had recently given birth only nine months ago to her baby daughter, Emily. Emily was a beautiful young girl, and I want to warn you all right now, the details that we're about to discuss are some of the most disturbing I've ever covered. So in October of 2016, Benjamin had only been living with his girlfriend Amanda for about a month. And on the morning of Emily's death at around 4.30 a.m., Amanda woke up and went downstairs to search for her baby. When she went downstairs, she saw Benjamin Taylor with his pants unzipped sitting in the dark. Amanda then noticed that her nine-month-old daughter's limp body was lying nearby on a pile of sheets and laundry. Amanda screamed at Benjamin and grabbed her daughter's lifeless body, but he remained silent and stared at the ground. The details of what had just happened down there are disturbing. Local authorities would call this the worst assault that they had seen in decades. You see, Benjamin and Emily were covered in the infant's blood. 
After the child's body was examined, the authorities were able to determine that she had been assaulted by an adult male multiple times. The infant child was also bleeding extensively and had suffered head trauma. Emily had a fractured skull and brain hemorrhaging. Authorities believe that Emily may have been shaken violently or even thrown to the ground or slammed against a hard object. When police arrived at the scene, Benjamin Taylor was observed trying to wipe something off of his groin. That was eventually determined to be Emily's blood. He also told authorities that he remembered taking the baby to the basement, but that he blacked out after that. You see, he had been smoking and drinking the night before, and that was his excuse. Thankfully, Benjamin was convicted of all charges and sentenced to life in prison without mercy, as you can see right here. But for some people, that just wasn't enough. And like I said at the beginning of this video, a petition was created which asked the government to publicly hang Benjamin. And this petition, before it was shut down, gathered over 50,000 signatures. I mean, this truly is one of the worst things that I've ever covered here on my TikTok. And personally, I don't think that life in prison is enough for this guy. I mean, the pain that poor Emily went through before she was eventually killed is just heartbreaking on every single level. And I just hope and pray that the other prisoners that are in there with Benjamin find out or already have found out exactly what he did to land himself in there. If you want to hear more true crime stories, listen to the podcast Murder in America that I co-host with my wife, Courtney. It's available on all streaming platforms. Sometimes true for strange non-fiction. The case of Richard Trenton Chase is a story which even the most depraved horror writer would struggle to create. Over the course of four weeks spanning across 1977 and 1978, Richard Chase took the lives of six innocent victims in Sacramento, California. His murders gradually progressed in violence, beginning with drive-by shootings and culminated in acts of... <laughs> saw in that video was 17 year old Bianca Devins and the story of her murder in 2019 is incredibly disturbing. Bianca was born on October 2nd 2001 in New York and throughout her youth she struggled with mental health issues like depression and anxiety and she found refuge in online communities in places like discord. Bianca had a pretty active online presence and in April of 2019 she attracted the attention of a man named Brandon Andrew Clark. Now, Brandon was 21 years old at the time and Bianca was 17, and the two became friendly with each other. Now, there are conflicting reports as to whether Bianca and Andrew were involved with each other, they were really good friends, or they weren't, but either way, the two of them ended up going to a show together in July of 2019. July 13th, 2019, Bianca, Brandon, and a friend named Alex go to a concert in New York City together, and at the show, Brandon watches, allegedly, Bianca kiss Alex. After the show was over, Bianca and Brandon were driving home together back to their hometown. And sadly, that's when Brandon decided to strike. Brandon began to assault Bianca and he then pulled out a long knife he had hidden in the car and began to saw away at her neck. When investigators later found Bianca, she had been nearly decapitated. And after murdering Bianca, Brandon got out of the car, built a bonfire, and spent some time listening to Joji. Brandon then began to post a series of cryptic messages on his Instagram accounts. Posts that when looked at together paint an extremely dark and disturbing picture. Shockingly, Brandon even took photos of Bianca's dead body and posted them online. There was also allegedly a video of the murder that he posted. Brandon then phoned the police himself, turning himself in, and stated that he had to complete the self-unaliving part of the murder self-unaliving. And when police finally arrived and approached Brandon, he took out a knife and started slashing at his own neck. Sadly, Bianca Devins was dead. She was only 17 years old. And after her murder, the internet was set into an absolute firestorm, with politicians and concerned parents raising the alarm on violence on social media. And disturbingly, Brandon Clark was hailed as a hero on 4chan messaging boards and in incel chat rooms, with people online praising him for his deplorable actions. Shockingly, the images of Bianca's body were online for a very long time with Bianca's own mother reporting that she could find the images on Facebook for days at a time without any action being taken to remove these images. Shockingly, in 2021, Brandon Clark was only sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. So that means that there is a possibility that this sick freak could be walking out amongst us in free society one day. I don't understand why they don't just give life in prison for an act like this, but there's still one disturbing twist in this case. 
You see, Bianca's family eventually sued the county district attorney's office because apparently the district attorney's office was sending materials to producers of documentaries and even YouTubers. Personal materials of Bianca's that included videos of her doing things, if you know what I'm saying, and nude photos of their dead daughter who was underage. I don't know whatever came out of that, but rest in peace to Bianca. This is just a terrible, horrible story. If you want to listen to more true crime stories, listen to the podcast that I co-host with my wife, Murder in America, available on all streaming platforms. Not watch this video unless you have a very strong stomach. This case is truly sickening. On August the 31st, 2019, Margaret Sumney was unreachable. Her family knew something was wrong. They tried and failed to get hold of her for two days before notifying police to ask them to do a welfare check. When police went to her house in Pennsylvania, what they discovered was horrifying. They found shattered glass all over the floor and blood smeared on the walls. They found the 67-year-old's body in the bath. She'd been beaten to death. The autopsy revealed that she died from blunt force trauma to the head. Police interviewed her son, David, who initially denied having anything to do with her death. However, police searched his phone and found absolutely disgusting images. They uncovered 277 sickening pictures, including selfies of David with her body, his face smeared in her blood and doing a thumbs up pose. Police also discovered that David was in possession of his mum's jewellery and several blank checks. He also had a record of previously assaulting his mother twice and attacking his now deceased father once. The same year as his mum's murder, he allegedly waterboarded and strangled his ex-girlfriend in an Atlantic City hotel. It's reported though that he just slipped through the cracks in the police databases, allowing him to go on to offend again. He was soon arrested and it was found that when he'd committed the murder of his mother, he'd taken a large amount of Adderall. His defence argued that he had diminished responsibility due to his substance and alcohol use. Originally, he was facing charges of first-degree murder and abuse of a corpse. However, due to a legal loophole, he entered a guilty plea, so he would only be charged with third-degree murder. He was sentenced to 20 to 40 years in prison. Terrifyingly, as he's now been in prison since 2019, and due to his good behaviour behind bars, he could be released in just 17 years. This guy is one of the most awful serial killers there has ever been, and I feel like he's never talked about. In my opinion, this guy's worse than Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer. Hi Meg, I talk about your crime. Let's get into the story of The Butcher, the worst serial killer Canada has ever seen. Robert Picton was born October 24th, 1949, in British Columbia, Canada. Robert had quite a bad upbringing. His dad was very abusive. He actually grew up on a pig farm. From a really young age, him and his brother had to work countless hours on this pig farm. And then they were forced to go straight to school without taking a shower or anything. Because he was showing up to school unwashed, Robert started getting bullied and they gave him the nickname Stinky Piggy. As Robert grew older, he was said to be very quiet, but he apparently sometimes had these weird bursts of bizarre behavior. These bursts would come out of nowhere and he would just start acting really strange. In 1996, Robert's brother opened up a kind of charity thing. The charity was started to try to make more money for their pig farm. It was called the Piggy Palace Good Times Society. And what they would do is they would hold huge parties and raves to try and raise money. And I'm not joking when I say huge parties and raves. 17,000 people were said to have shown up at one point. 17,000 people at once. Sex workers and biker gangs would join these parties as well, but for Robert, it all started going downhill in 1997 when he attempted to murder a girl. I don't usually do this in these videos, but a lot of you ask what blush I use, and this is the blush I use. It's usually 10 pounds on the TikTok shop, but it's on for Fiverr right now. So if you click right here, you can get it. I just ordered kind of a peachy version of this. I'm not being paid to talk about this, I just saw they were on offer and you guys ask about these all the time, so get your hands on them for cheap while you can. So Robert attempts to murder a woman for the first time that we know of. According to her statement, he attempted to handcuff her and then he started stabbing her multiple times before she managed to get away. This should have been the thing that got him on police radar, but he was able to get the charges dropped because the woman he attacked was on a lot of drugs at the time and Robert used that to come up with a story. He told police like, she was hitchhiking, I was just trying to help her and she attacked me. 
and they believed him because she was on drugs. And unfortunately, for the next 60 women he would kill, he was let go. And he was able to come up with a strategy that wouldn't get him caught next time. He developed a plan and started killing a bunch of women. And Robert was really, really good at staying under the radar. Now, what did he do exactly? Let me tell you. Because it's just, it's disturbing. First of all, he always went for hitchhikers, addicts, or prostitutes. And what he would do is he would promise them money, drugs, accommodation, anything to get them back to his farm. Once he got them back, he would then shoot or strangle them to death. And this next part is why he was given the name the Butcher. He would take the victims' bodies, chop them up, and feed them to his pigs. Now, if you're not aware of this already, pigs will literally eat anything. Everything. So the evidence was just, bye. They were getting rid of the evidence for him. All of a sudden, there is an increase in missing women in the area. But sadly, because he only went after sex workers or addicts or hitchhikers, no one cared. And this always makes me so mad with cases like these. Like, they're still human beings, but no bodies were showing up, so there was no crime, no body, no crime. But as the numbers started rising, people were kind of getting a bit worried. A group of people that weren't the police actually got a list together of all of the names of these young women who were missing. They brought that to the police and were like, do you see now? And that's when the investigation actually began into finding out what happened to these girls. And all of these girls had one person in common, Robert Picton. He was the only person whose name continuously came up when they were looking for these girls. Police needed a way to get onto the farm with a warrant without him knowing about it and hiding all the evidence first. And so they heard that he had possession of an illegal firearm. And so they used that as the cover up to get onto his property. On the property, they found multiple items that belonged to these missing women along with some blood-stained clothing and tiny bone fragments. Now, things aren't looking too good for Robert, but because the pigs had eaten all the evidence, basically all of it, they were only able to charge him with the murder of six women. And so he got six counts of murder. When he got arrested, he actually said that he killed 49 women and that he was sad that he didn't get to round up to 50. What the hell, Robert? What does he want the police officer to say like, oh, I feel so bad for you. No. He was arrested in 2002 and this trial was huge. Of course, he was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. But guys, that's not the worst part of this story because I'm getting to that now. One element of the story that I kept out until now is that Robert, <laughs> Robert sold the meat of his pigs to people who lived around the area. These pigs who ate the remains of 60 women were sold to his neighbors. When I say neighbors, I just mean people who live in the area. So like secondhand, cam can secondhand cannibalism. I could never eat pig again if that was me. So yeah, they were pretty um, disturbed and freaked out by this information, which is uh, totally understandable and just totally disgusting. After a huge search of his property, police now believe that the number of women Robert killed was in the 60s. 60 women. 60 mother, daughters, wives. It's insane. It really annoys me with cases like these. I know it was like in 2002 and things have changed, but have they? I find that a lot of cases like these that I cover always start with, oh, all these women were going missing, but they were sex workers, but they were drug addicts, who cares? And it's like, it's insane to me that like they're not seen as equals to any other woman walking on the street, but whatever, hopefully that changes. And for those wondering, I have actually covered this story before, but the quality of the video was so, so bad that I just, I couldn't keep it up anymore. 
like it really bothered me to watch back so I thought I would remake it in a higher quality way. I hope you guys enjoyed it regardless and have a wonderful day. My heart goes out to every single one of the victims, their families, and people who cared about them. Um, and I hope Robert rots in jail. Anyways, this is not a good representation of Canadians. We're actually really nice people. I'll see you all in the next video. Love you guys. Bye. This little girl got revenge on her killer from beyond the grave. On the 25th of January 2005, Katie Coleman finished school and went back to her home in Indiana, United States. Katie was 10 years old and lived with her mum and dad and sister. At 3pm that day, her mum asked her to go to the dollar store to get toilet roll. Now Katie knew the area well and it wasn't really far to go. After getting the toilet roll from the shop, Katie stopped at the bank to get a lollipop for her way home. However, when Katie's dad returned home, the little girl still wasn't back. Her parents called police and a few days later an amber alert was issued. A witness came forward to say that they'd seen a girl who looked like Katie in a truck. The driver was described as a skinny white man about six feet tall with short dark hair and fair complexion. Tragically, five days after going missing, Katie's body was found. It was in a creek just a few miles from her home. Disturbingly, her hands and feet were tied and she had been essayed. It was determined that her cause of death had been drowning. 20-year-old Charles Hickman rang the police to confess. He said he and another man had abducted Katie after she'd witnessed a substance deal. He said they tried to scare her into not saying anything and they tied her up, but she ended up falling in and drowning. Disgustingly, this turned out to be a false confession. This obviously wasted police time and caused massive amounts of distress to Katie's family. Police continued to look for evidence and they did find a cigarette butt near to Katie's body. They tested it for DNA and it matched a man called Anthony Stockelman. Police compared the DNA on the cigarette butt to the DNA on Katie's body and it was a match. Anthony, a father of two young boys, was in the area that day visiting his mother. He entered a guilty plea and was given life in prison without parole. But this is not the only punishment that Anthony would receive. Now, Anthony claims that he was under the influence of extreme mental or emotional disturbance during the crime. He said this is because his father had died six months prior. Regardless, Anthony was imprisoned. Unlucky for Anthony, he was actually housed in a prison with Katie's cousin. Jared Harris was serving a sentence for burglary and was in the same wing as Anthony. Jared forcibly tattooed the words Katie's revenge across Anthony's forehead. He wanted to brand Anthony for life for killing his young cousin. 